All right, um, looks like we have a full house, so let's get started. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our fraud detection in finance with AI webinar. Uh, today, you will be getting a chance to learn how to spot signs of fraud in your data, along with deep learning and shallow learning techniques to identify fraud. Uh, but just a quick note before we get started, um, today's session is listen in mode only. So if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the box below, and we will do our best to get them answered for you at the end of our presentation. Uh, also, for those of you wondering, uh, yes, this session will be recorded, and we will get a copy of that along with a copy of our slides to you following um, the presentation shortly. Okay, so joining us today, we have Piero Dimitri. He is our practice lead for strategy and AI here at NewComp. So feel free to ask him any questions as we go along, and I hope you enjoy this session. So Piero, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, super excited to be doing this session with you today. Uh, I'll be uh, talking just a little bit about um, myself and uh, new comp uh, in the first little bit, uh, but then we'll continue with um, the uh, slides that I've prepared for you, but also at the same time, we'll be dealing with um, a couple of live demos that I have prepared if time permits. Um, the live demos will be taking place in Databricks, but of course you can use any notebooking tools uh, to kind of go through them. Uh, we will be doing it in Python and I'll be showcasing some of the capabilities in Databricks, uh, but ultimately uh, the tools and technologies are swappable. The concepts and the algorithms uh, remain the same no matter what tool and technology you use. The goal of this uh, webinar today is to essentially have um, everybody come out with at least a, an understanding of how we can use uh, machine learning and AI algorithms to essentially detect fraud. And there's a key concept that underpins uh, fraud, and, and we're going directly to the root. Uh, we're not even going to try to tackle or build business rules around, you know, uh, what fraud looks like, but we're going to go directly to the root. And I'll talk about that uh, more as we go through it uh, today. A little bit about me. I am the practice lead uh, for strategy and AI here at New Comp Analytics. I spend most of my time designing strategies, designing architectures and infrastructures, um, and ultimately algorithms that make uh, analytics a valuable uh, business capability for uh, our clients. So uh, I spend most of my days uh, thinking of solutions and coming up with solutions. Um, and uh, it's just one of those things that um, uh, I enjoy doing. Um, I do also teach at the University of Toronto, Queens, and Ontario Tech, uh, various roles uh, throughout those three universities, uh, but um, it is mostly related with Python data and analytics and uh, a little bit of machine learning and AI. Outside of work, I am a private pilot. Uh, I do enjoy uh, spending some time with my uh, Husky Malamute, and then occasionally I do DJ uh, some parties here and there. So a little bit about New Comp. Um, New Comp is... Uh, an a analytics uh, consulting firm focused specifically on data analytics and AI. Um, and we've been doing this since 1997. Uh, we are uh, partnered with a couple of the biggest vendors uh, that um, work in uh, AI and analytics, uh, IBM Platinum Partner, Microsoft Gold Partner, uh, Altrix Premier Partner, Tableau Gold Partner. And we're working on our partnerships with Snowflake, Data Robot, Denoto, uh, Databricks um, and ThoughtSpot. So um, we have presence across uh, and capabilities across multiple ver uh, multiple vendors and multiple tools and technologies uh, that we help our partners with. So this is exactly uh, kind of in our wheelhouse. What are the capabilities that we help our clients with? We focus on five key capabilities. The first one being AI and machine learning. So this is something new. Navigating the waters of AI and machine learning is essentially something that a lot of clients need uh, some advice with uh, what is possible, what's not possible, uh, trying to uh, pin uh, expectations to what is reality versus uh, what is hype. Um, in terms of data engineering, we help uh, our clients uh, build pipelines, uh, transformation pipelines that take data from source to destination and then transform it along the way. Uh, we also visualize data, use BI tools uh, to create uh, dashboards and reports. Uh, we do have a strong financial planning and analytics practice. Uh, 
uh, that ties in perfectly with the first three capabilities that we talked about, more about uh, corporate performance management, strategic uh, corporate performance management, and then ultimately KPI monitoring and analytics downstream. And then finally, we can't do any of this without doing some work in the cloud. Uh, so uh, dealing with some of that infrastructure that underpins all of these solutions uh, is just necessary when it comes to what we're doing. So uh, essentially, it's something that we do. Um, this is a, uh, all five of the, our core competencies, um, and this is what we like to focus in so that we can get really, really good and deliver the most amount of value to, to our clients. So that's just a quick introduction. What I'd like to do is jump right into the content that we've built today. Uh, first things first, we are talking about fraud detection. Uh, we are talking about um, you know, how to detect fraud in the financial industry. Uh, I understand that there's many applications in the uh, financial industry, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the first thing that we really want to identify or at least kind of talk about is what is fraud. Uh, I know a lot of people kind of uh, have their own definitions depending on the context that they'd like to provide. But ultimately, ultimately, uh, fraud is some wrongful or criminal uh, deception intended to result in some financial or personal gain. So the crux of any fraud, uh, the crux of um, any type of wrongful or criminal deception ultimately ends in some sort of financial and personal gain. So it doesn't matter whether it's in insurance, whether it's in banking, whether it's in investments, whether it's in uh, you know, multitudes of, of, of applications within the financial industry, ultimately the end goal is some uh, more often than not financial gain or some sort of personal gain. So how we structure our problems around fraud and fraud detection is trying to identify how does the person uh, or corporation or entity benefit uh, from the actions that they're doing and ultimately it's in some way shape or form because they receive more money that they're supposed to uh, and then ultimately kind of tie every variable every action every transaction everything that uh, every data point that is collected ultimately back to uh, how much money is being handed out whether it's in uh, banking insurance or any of those things. So ultimately the crux of the problem when it comes to solving fraud with math is to identify the financial and personal gain. So ultimately that's how we build the problem. That's how we build the algorithms. Uh, and then we, we kind of go from, uh, from there. Uh, this, is, um, this is something that uh, is kind of a transformation within the financial, in, uh, financial industry. Um, most uh, most ways of tackling uh, fraud currently uh, rely on uh, business rules. So it relies on having a group of or a team of analysts uh, going through a transaction history, looking for you know anomalies, building graphical uh, charts, box and uh, line plots, and uh, sorry, box plots, line uh, line graphs. Uh, and looking at what really sticks out. But as you can imagine, doing that for 2 million, 3 million, up to 10 million customers uh, with some of the largest um, financial industry uh, financial industry corporations in Canada, uh, well, you'd need a, a, a crazy team to, to be doing that. So uh, what we want to do is instead of tackling it through a business rule, very deterministic, if this, then that type of way, what we want to do is take every data point that we have on every customer, feed it through a model, and then ultimately look for uh, outlying behavior, behavior that is not normal, behavior that kind of um, changes uh, the, what, what we define as normal. So um, not everybody, the, the underlying assumption here is that not everybody's committing fraud. Uh, it's only the few that are committing fraud. So we use um, we use the normal many to determine the outlying uh, few. And, that's, and that essentially is the crux of detecting fraud, uh, ultimately tying it back into what is the personal or financial gain. So what are the different uh, types of fraud <clears throat> that uh, we've experienced or we have uh, worked with? Uh, well, we, we have kind of uh, tackled um, three big uh, types of um, at least uh, uh, vendors in the financial in industry. Uh, one is everyday banking vendors. We're dealing with things like identity theft. Uh, we're dealing with things like credit and debit card fraud. We're dealing with things like phishing. And then we're dealing with things like fake checks. So 
Uh, looking at things like identity theft, well, how do we determine when somebody's identity has been stolen? Um, there are things, there are ways that we can do this uh, when we look at, uh, you know, building a customer profile and then ultimately looking at what it is that they're trying to do. So if they're, for example, looking to pull out a uh, line of credit that typically uh, extends way further than um, all their other lines of credit, that's a red flag and that's something that should be uh, kind of outlined. Um, ultimately, uh, we, we kind of look at the, uh, the behavior of, custom, of that specific customer and customers like them um, and then look at what would be outlined as normal versus what's not normal and then outline that uh, behavior as probably um, as, some type, as some type of anomaly and then using some business rules to identify what the anomaly is. So for example, if somebody is looking for um, fraud or looking for um, to get a line of credit that's more than uh, what customers like them would be looking for, uh, well, that essentially uh, would be flagged as kind of anomaly, uh, anomalous behavior, but at the same time uh, would be looking at things like where was the application done? Was it further than their uh, uh, place of employment or place of uh, residence? And then ultimately looking at, well, um, other factors that can determine or flag identity theft. Credit card and debit card fraud. Uh, once again, it's all about use, uh, location of use versus location of residence and employment. Uh, latitude, uh, latitude and longitude, believe it or not, are some of the best mathematical input variables to any model, uh, partially because when we deal with fraud anomaly detection uh, algorithms, one of the strongest algorithms we have are detection or distance-based algorithms. So if your cluster of activity is usually around the bottom left corner of the X, Y axis, but you now have a dot that's in the top right corner of that graph, well, you can automatically see how that is an outline, um, as an outlying, uh, at least um, outlying data point. And now what happens if my X, Y data plot is now latitude and longitude? Well, it's kind of the same thing, right? So you have a cluster, let's say near Toronto, near Calgary, near whatever city, and then you all of a sudden have a cluster somewhere north of that in Yukon or uh, somewhere else. Uh, automatically, that lat long uh, tells you uh, that you have some sort of outlying behavior. So uh, geographic distance serves as one of the greatest uh, variables that you can input to any fraud detection algorithm. Uh, same thing with phishing. Uh, phishing typically happens uh, when some uh, user has uh, been uh, exposed and ultimately has given, uh, if not all, some of their personal information to a bad actor. Um, that bad actor then has to try at least to determine uh, the rest of the picture. So they may have your, um, they may have your, for example, your password and your email but they don't have your mother's maiden name on the security question. So um, what they'll typically do is they'll have a few tries and attempts at guessing your mother's maiden name. Most password uh, systems will say, well, actually, yeah, that's, that's you know, this person guessed their password correctly, uh, but they're having a tough time with this. They'll usually show a different question or something of that sort. So it's all about looking at uh, transactions into your login history or looking at transactions within um, your um, access history to look at where has phishing occurred. Uh, normally, it does not take 150 tries to guess your mother's maiden name. So something like that would be anomalous behavior. Uh, in many cases, these have kind of been uh, shut down, but um, uh, there's, a, there's a limit to how many times you can attempt things like that. But in some cases, I've seen where a user can have over you know, 200, 300 tries uh, and a bad actor can automate the guessing of, of names based on, uh, you know, based on a rank of popularity. Uh, fake check is one of the toughest ones uh, to, to look at. Um, ultimately, uh, the reason I put fake check on here is because we can actually use anomaly detection algorithms uh, when it comes to images. So one of the things that all banks do is that they decide to scan images of the checks. And ultimately what we could do is we can have an algorithm that pulls out the signature and uses anomaly detection uh, and uses an anomaly detection algorithm to ultimately verify that signature uh, back to the signature on file. So, believe it or not, even handwriting uh, is something that uh, is actually um, uh, we can use an anomaly detection algorithm for. So, 
Uh, it doesn't only necessarily have to be limited to numerical transactions. It doesn't necessarily have to be just limited to uh, location or geolocation or things like that. It can also extend beyond uh, rows and columns and go into things like images where we can use uh, pixel data, pixel uh, image pixel data to ultimately determine whether things like a signature uh, have you know that right uh, curve or something like that in the spot or the pixel that it's expected to be in. So very, very important when it comes to things like that. And then we have some of the more complex financial problems that we need to solve money laundering, uh, tax fraud, investment fraud, money laundering. Uh, you know, when we talk about the everyday banking, these are simple algorithms. These are simple algorithms that just consider a very simple input data set, which is customer uh, information, transaction information on that customer, and then in transaction information on customers within that same segment as the initial customer. When it comes to the complex financial situations, uh, this is this is kind of stepping into that big data world. Now we're looking at, when we're looking at money laundering, we're looking at a network of many customers. We're looking at a network of not just one or two uh, kind of um, uh, segments. We're looking at segment, uh, you know, customers across all segments, across all geographies. But ultimately, what ties them together is this network of um, like transactions or transactions that match in terms of amount uh, and transactions that match in terms of. Um, you know, flowing uh, back uh, dates and flowing, um, uh, ultimately flowing money. Um, so when we do that, we're, we're kind of stepping into this realm of, uh, of big data, um, but ultimately we're still looking for anomaly behavior. So uh, anomaly behavior would look something like, um, you know, I send you $200 and then five days later you send me back $200. Uh, that is not typically something that most people do when they send money uh, to somebody, they don't expect it back within five days. So we're looking at creating lags and looking at, well, how was that money sent back in X number of days? Was that money sent back in uh, some other form of um, uh, method, whether it's cash, whether it's, um, if it's not through e-transfer, if it's not through cash, if it's through some other method, uh, wire transfer, something like that. Let's create that ring. Let's create the closed loop and then look at whether or not that's an anomaly or not. And in most cases, anytime there's a closed loop, uh, chances are that that is anomaly uh, in its behavior. So uh, we look at tax fraud. Tax fraud is really, really interesting. Uh, a use case within tax fraud is uh, retailers trying to look at um, uh, working with the CRA to look at, at least in Canada, to look at who might be skimming uh, in, the, uh, in the retail uh, line or the checkout line who, who which of the agents that work within the uh, the retailer are kind of scanning one skipping one uh, and looking at uh, well if that's uh, items of value that they're skipping or if it's just uh, you know uh, if it's just a genuine mistake uh, in most cases what happens is that um, uh, ch uh, tellers cashiers or so on and so forth what they'll do is they'll you know scan one skip one but that's ultimately lost revenue, not only to the business, but that's also lost revenue to the CRA. So they're very, very invested in looking at the transaction behaviors at retailers to look at, well, you know, how can this be uh, deemed uh, not just uh, fraud for uh, purposes of stealing or something like that, but also at the same time, uh, tax fraud. So uh, don't ever kind of, if you're ever a cashier, don't ever scan one, skip one. Uh, it's more than just stealing. It's also tax fraud. And you can be kind of, uh, brought into way more. The other thing, uh, of, of course, working with the CRA and looking at things like uh, who is under declaring, over declaring, looking at anomalous behavior. Uh, the CRA really does things, is starting now to do things with a more uh, machine learning uh, kind of viewpoint on Canadians, uh, whereas before it used to be random uh, and also business rules. So if you failed some business rules, you got selected for an audit. Uh, and then they have some agents looking at profiles randomly um, and then uh, ultimately just kind of uh, deciding who to audit and who not to audit. Uh, but now we're kind of looking at uh, creating segments and models for the CRA and then ultimately uh, having the CRA be smart about who they audit. They also have a limit into the amount of uh, resources that they have. Uh, so it's ultimately... Um, 
you know, it's ultimately not going to be, uh, it's going to help them kind of prioritize their caseload rather than uh, just chase whatever comes their way, essentially. Uh, investment fraud, we can get into this uh, many times over, but Ponzi schemes, things like that, those are usually investments, frauds. Uh, banks are constantly on the lookout for this, um, especially in cooperation with other banks. Uh, they'll have people who, you know, take some money to pay off an old debt and then continue, kind of continue that cycle. Uh, that is anomalous behavior. Most people don't kind of get some money, pay off an old debt, and then use some more money to pay off an old debt. So that lag on that time base is also really, really important when it comes uh, when it comes to kind of uh, investment fraud. Uh, we also have on the insurance space, basically where the most amount of ROI for any fraud activity comes from is within the insurance space. Uh, within the insurance space, we have claims fraud, uh, which stands to be one of the largest um, causes of increased premiums, uh, especially when it comes to Ontario, especially when it comes to uh, BC and places um, that have uh, highly regulated uh, insurance premiums. Uh, claims fraud simply work by having, um, you know, a, an individual or overestimate uh, the amount that they uh, of damage that they've uh, they've either caused or um, have uh, have caused have kind of had on them uh, or of their property. Uh, by doing that, essentially, what happens is, um, you know, uh, all those are losses that the insurance company has to cover, and they usually cover that. Uh, through increased premiums and not necessarily only to those higher at risk, uh, but generally to the overall customer base, which uh, negatively impacts not only the insurer, but also the customers as well. So looking at and trying to identify um, how, um, you know, how much the property damage is uh, when it comes to a specific event. So say we had uh, in Barrie last year, we had a tornado Um that tornado affected a row of homes on a specific street. Uh, those homes generally cost the same amount of money, but if the claims for one of those homes was a lot higher than the claims for the others, uh, that's usually an, an indication of fraud. That's usually an indication of uh, something's going on here that's fishy. And most of the time there's a, an adjuster that uh, inputs that information. Most of the time there's a uh, contractor that goes out to essentially uh, look at the property damage, uh, but in most cases, um, you know, the contractors and the the folks hired by the insurance company are the ones that are part of the uh, fraud as well. They get a kickback or something of the sort. Uh, another type of um, uh, insurance anomaly detection that we we really work, uh, would like to work with is uh, crime rings. Uh, this is um, this is really, really important. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, uh, you know, challenges in Ontario uh, car insurance are uh, tow truck crime rings. Um, it did escalate out of hand about two years ago. Now there's a couple of uh, new legislations in place uh, to take care of this. But essentially, what happens is um, insurance companies got together, bonded together, uh, looked at anomalous behavior, uh, and determined that many tow truck companies work uh, in uh, unison with essentially um, uh, mechanics, body shops, uh, looking at uh, um, auto scrappers, uh, things like that. And they work in unison to essentially create a, what's known as a crime ring, where a tow truck driver tows a perfectly good car to a mechanic. A mechanic says, nope, this is wrong, takes it to a salvager. The salvager salvages the car. All that kind of working in unison to essentially uh, up the cost of the claim, and then ultimately uh, the payout being uh, more than what it needs to be. So having multiple people involved, uh, especially when it's vendors uh, providing a service, um, is, is something that's, uh, that's anomalous. And then using um, anomaly detection algorithms, you can kind of see. Uh, in many cases, crime rings involve the same uh, set of people. Uh, so you'll always, you know, you kind of become red flagged after uh, a while if, if you've been um, if you've been participating in a crime ring. Uh, any behavior you partake in uh, with any of the insurers kind of becomes um, a flag for anomalies uh, down the road. Even if, if even if um, you're behaving, you know, uh, normal or not anomalous, um, 
and and all your variables and mathematical parameters just by the fact that uh, your historical records say that you had anomalous behavior you'll kind of be flagged because now uh, the name kind of becomes uh, the the flag for uh, anomalous behavior and then data falsification uh, well this is pretty straightforward uh, false certificates for home insurance false certificates for auto insurance uh, some folks saying they have you know a 2018 uh, Honda Civic uh, when in fact uh, it's a 28 Honda Civic with basically no engine no steering wheel nothing on the inside um, and you know it's a stripped down version and then ultimately uh, stage some type of fire theft or something of the sort and then claim much higher than what the actual value of the car is so um, data falsification is another issue um, looking at you know uh, how much the value of a car is versus how much the claims are. There's many more types of fraud. Uh, these are just some of the the, the uh, most common ones that we've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, very, very interesting, very, very um, kind of um, uh, a growing field, I would say, um, a very um, hot topic uh, when it comes to what, what's on the mind of financial industry um, uh, leaders, uh, but ultimately, all of these can all be tackled with one type of algorithm. So I'd like, I, I've been saying this a lot, the anomaly outlier detection, anomaly detection, outlier detection algorithms, uh, but one type of algorithm can take care of all those fraud scenarios uh, and then more. And, and why is that? And, and how does it do that? Because ultimately it focuses on the financial or personal gain when it comes to taking part in those fraud rings. So ultimately, it doesn't really matter what the inputs are. We're looking at what's the output, what's the payout, what's the dollar per hour, what's the so on and so forth that kind of tackles what the financial or personal gain is. Um, and ultimately, we've become so good that we've built these models. We've trained these models on specific customers. We've trained these models on uh, specific retailers, on specific vendors, corporations, and so on and so forth, uh, that we can actually do this in real time. So I know, I bank with um, uh, one of Canada's big five. I know that uh, at my bank, they have an, uh, an algorithm that essentially has uh, identified my transaction history and my transaction uh, profile. Uh, and essentially what happens is there's an algorithm behind the scenes that if I'm in, for example, another country, in, let's say in uh, South America, and I'm taking out uh, an amount of uh, $12,000 on uh, something uh, like my Visa card, for example, um, well, then ultimately that, uh, that gets flagged because that model has been trained to say 12,000 Visa, uh, latitude here, longitude here. It takes all those variables into consideration and says, no, nope, this is too far away from that central cluster of what their transactions look like. This is way too far away. Um, and ultimately, I know we said in the X, Y, but uh, I gave you four variables. Well, we can do X, Y, Z. And it's very easy to imagine kind of a 3D, um, a 3D cluster. But how does a 4D cluster work? or a 5D cluster, right? It's very hard to visualize, uh, but what happens is uh, the math is there. So some of those visual-based algorithms that you know we're starting with, that we're using, become very, very challenging when we start to incorporate more than two or three variables because they become very hard to graph. And then you kind of have to do the, this complex math in your head to say, well, how does latitude compare versus latitude? How does latitude versus dollars? How does longitude versus dollars? And it becomes a complex challenge. But nonetheless, we don't need to visualize everything. We have the math that does it for us in many, many dimensions. Uh, and we can have more than one, two, or three input variables and still build a proper transaction profile, uh, claims profile, customer profile, and then ultimately look at what is the outlying behavior and is it outlying behavior in comparison to that profile? Uh, and that's essentially, we've gotten so good, we have the computing power and the processing power to be able to actually do this in real time. Uh, so what happens is that transaction, let's say I, uh, on my account, there's a transaction coming from South America for $12,000 on my visa. It passes through 
a quick check on my algorithm. My algorithm is able to do this really quickly and, and output a value within a nanosecond um, and then ultimately tells the transaction broker, no, this, this doesn't look right, decline it. And then at the same time, you can trigger downstream actions like for example, texting um, the customer or emailing the customer or even phone calling the customer to say, um, hey, are you in South America spending $12,000 on your visa? Um, and that can ultimately be the difference between money lost and money recovered. So um, that's that's essentially uh, how we kind of tackle them. Uh, let's kind of look at the steps. I know I've talked about this uh, many in many kind of um, ways and how to approach it, but let's kind of look at the three general steps of how we build uh, anomaly or outlier detection algorithms. One, build a profile of the normal behavior. So this is more of a data engineering step uh, with some uh, statistical uh, step involved. Uh, so building a profile normal behavior, while well, we're looking at me as a customer, for example, what, do my, what does my transaction history look like? What does a normal transaction look like? Uh, for me, and it, it starts with all those variables that we talked about: date, time, latitude, longitude, amount, um, what card is it coming from, what account is it coming from, and all of these things. And adding those variables in and building this general model that says, "Oh, this is what a normal profile would look like." On top of that, what we can do is look at customers like me, and then take all of those averaged out variables and add them as well. So for example, someone like me would not be on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. in South America spending $12,000 on their visa when I just spent um, you know, $2 for my morning coffee at Starbucks in Toronto. So looking at that general profile history and general transaction history, well, you start to now kind of understand uh, what normal and not normal looks like. And then you look at the general profile and say, well, actually, uh, most people, you know, that live in Toronto that, uh, you know, have um, uh, this type of uh, profile would not be in South America spending $12,000 at this time of day. So it builds that profile of the normal. And then ultimately identify the goal of a financial or personal gain. So in this case, uh, we're trying to figure out um, transaction fraud. Uh, so transaction fraud, I think the goal is fairly simple. Uh, money extracted from an account that shouldn't be. So it's dollars uh, withdrawn, dollars taken out, uh, you know, any, any form of debit, dollars in debit uh, to a specific account. So it's a very, very simple KPI. It's a very, very simple uh, kind of um, outcome. Uh, and ultimately, mo in many cases, it usually does tie into some dollar per uh, you know, well, whether it's dollar withdrawn or dollar per hour or something like that. And an example where you have, uh, uh, you know, a cashier kind of um, uh, scanning one and skipping one, then you're looking at something like dollars per hour. What is that person scanning every hour in terms of dollar amount versus uh, what's actually being shown uh, by their peers. So all the other cashiers and so on and so forth. And then you're looking at how many dollars lost uh, per hour by a specific cashier. So uh, it's all about identifying how the, there's a gain or a personal uh, or financial gain, and then kind of identifying that and, and then um, quantifying that in some form of metric or KPI. And then ultimately using normal profile, um, to build a model and then detect the anomalies. So we have our input variables, which is uh, all of these profile uh, statistics. We have our output variable, which is dollars, dollars per hour, dollars per uh, claim, dollars per whatever. Uh, we bring all of these together. And what we do is we build uh, our anomaly detection algorithm. There's tons of anomaly detection algorithms. Uh, we're gonna have time to kind of go through one in Python today. Um, we're going to talk about that and then look at ultimately uh, whether supervised or unsupervised and then look at ultimately how can we identify fraud and not um, identify, uh, you know, nor normal behavior. Uh, so there's uh, three types of anomaly detection algorithms. There's graphical and statistical based. So we talked about how there's uh, analysts at various banks who are looking at each customer one by one. Anytime a customer set, calls in and says, hey, I didn't make 
this transaction. This isn't me. Then you have that case assigned to a person. That person then goes and looks at their transaction history, looks at the vendor's transaction history, looks at the amounts, the dates, the times, the locations, and all that, and then makes a determination and says, yeah, we actually believe this is fraud. This needs to be sent out for uh, investigation. Well, we can actually take all of that. That process takes about six or seven days, and that's a limitation, but nonetheless, it gets you to anomaly detected. And that's a limitation. We can take all of that and kind of bring it down to two types of automated algorithms, uh, one being distance-based. So we talked about clusters and then looking at the distance from those clusters. And I have an example coming up shortly. Uh, and then the second one would be some sort of model-based um, algorithm, which we'll be doing a demo on uh, today. So using models like time series or uh, more complicated statistical models like decision tree classifiers or um, random forest classifiers, we can actually look at all these variables, build that model in real time, and then try to predict whether these transactions are fraud or not. So let's look at that first distance-based uh, kind of uh, uh, set of algorithms. Distance-based is very, very uh, simple to implement, and it's very, very simple to kind of understand. Uh, it's all based off of um, averages and distances from a, an average. So when we look at a graph like this, we have property damage on the left-hand side, and we have claim payout on the, on the x-axis. So ultimately, what we're comparing here, and this is only two variables. Now, no model, no insurance adjuster would ever make a decision on two variables. It'd be more than that. Uh, way more than that. But what we're going to do here is we're going to imagine a, a scenario in which uh, the money that was paid out uh, and the property damage that happened to the property uh, are not in sync. Now, typically in insurance, the property damage does not always talk about the claim payout. There's additional costs, uh, like, for example, having a contractor come in and inspect the contractor needs to be paid. There's uh, fees that may be associated to clearing some initial damage, uh, some clearing some initial obstructions and things like that. So looking at various things like, you know, what is the raw property damage versus what is it that we actually paid out on that property damage? And what we can see here is that we have a big cluster here at the bottom. So this is kind of like those uh, low value, you know, maybe a tree hit my car or, um, you know, some, uh, something uh, very, very small, like a, um, you know, just like a very small property damage, looking at broken glass from a windstorm, things like that. We have some of the high value uh, property damage where we're looking at, you know, fire, arson, things like that of a criminal nature. But then we have outlying behavior like this, where we have low property damage, but a very, very, very high claim payout. So something like that, we can automatically see uh, from a graphical perspective that yes, it's an outlying behavior. But how can we do this mathematically to say, well, I need to know that that's outlying behavior. And the way we do that is by first determining our clusters and our clusters averages. So what we do is we have a mathematical algorithm that literally looks at each point and determines the distance to all of its nearest neighbors, including these, including these, and including these. Now, as you can imagine, the distance to everything in its cluster is going to be very small. The distance to this next cluster is going to be slightly bigger, but still on par with all of these other distances here. But when we look at something like the distance between this, these clusters here, and a dot like over here, well, those distances are going to be much, much bigger. We're talking about distances like this uh, between the top two uh, dots and then all the way from that top left dot to that bottom right dot. So those distances are going to be much, much bigger. And when we're dealing with distances like that, you have a normal set and then you also have this very, very abnormal set. And how we determine that is once we determine all the distances of all the points, whether it's in 2D or in 3D or even in four, five, six, n number of dimensions, we still, we have the math to do that. What happens is we take one of those dots out and we look at the average, and then we put that dot back in. Take another dot out and look at the average. Now, ultimately, when you take one or two of these dots out, that average is going to reduce drastically because you just took out the one number that was skewing your results out. And when you do that, you'll actually notice that, wait a minute, that point is now an anomaly because my average is just skewed uh, 
absolutely completely. So when we deal with distances, that's kind of essentially how we do it. Uh, same kind of uh, idea here. We also have, uh, uh, you know, graphical base. This is obviously another scenario like the one before, but what we are able to do in this case is kind of uh, look at clusters uh, and look at not just um, uh, the nearest neighbors, but looking at creating some clusters. So uh, determining, you know, uh, how far each ones are from each other, and then looking at any outliers from, from that cluster. So instead of looking at, for example, uh, in this scenario, every single dot and the distance to that possible fraud dot and taking averages, in this scenario, what we're doing is we're taking clusters, finding their average point, uh, calling that the cluster mean, and then doing the distance between the cluster mean and any outlier that we have here. And when that distance between the cluster mean and the outlier is large, well, there we have it. Um, and then obviously we have some model-based um, uh, outlier detection. So these are way more specific and way more tailored to specific use cases. Uh, so in a, in a model like a time series, which is what we have here, um, we expect to see some typical repetition in our time series model. And if we were to model that, we would say that the peak on this first one will probably average out at the tops of the other one. But as soon as we have that peak that has an error, a very, very high rare error from what we would predict it to be to what it actually is, well, high error in our prediction versus reality, that's usually indicative of some anomalous behavior. So we want to be able to identify that. We want to be able to flag that and then looking at predicted versus actual and looking at where the error between these two values is really, really high is usually indicative. It goes the same way for the second scenario and the second example that we have there. Uh, what happens is we're expecting very, very, very high peaks, but then we get this very small peak there. Well, that's again an error. It's just an error in the opposite direction in the negative. Uh, but in this case, it's still an error of a, a value that's very, very large. So we want to be looking at uh, where our errors are very, very different. So we have three kind of different ways looking at uh, cluster means and distances. We have uh, cluster points and distances, and then we have model-based errors. So looking at predicted versus actual, looking at the errors, and then determining where those errors are really, really large, and then kind of working from there. We also have another model-based. Um, we also have another model-based um, uh, approach, and that's using something other than a, um, uh, a time series algorithm. In this scenario, I'm going to show you, we're going to have a visual demo in Databricks. We're going to be using a credit card transaction file. This is a common file. This is not representative of any real uh, data uh, per se. It has been scrubbed, normalized, standardized, so that no identifying marks uh, can be created. Uh, they have also been altered uh, in some small ways just to protect the identity, but these do come from a real data set, but once again have gone through that physical process of changing. Now, nonetheless, it still presents the concept that we're trying to uh, show today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly uh, open, a sh go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and ultimately, once that screen comes up, we'll just kind of get going. Uh, so what I have here uh, is Databricks open. Uh, you'll notice that I'm using it on Microsoft Azure, but of course you can use this on any cloud platform um, or you can use this as a standalone install server on your own computer. Ultimately, what it, Databricks provides me with is a platform to, all, uh, to run Python scripts, uh, to have some files uploaded, to create a workspace, uh, to create some repositories where I can constantly improve uh, my and develop on my code. Uh, and then have some data compute and workflow capabilities as well. So storing data into some SQL, uh, using some compute uh, uh, capabilities to either scale up or scale down my processing, and then creating workflows when things happen. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a model. I've imported some of my core dependencies here, and then I've also imported my data set. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a look at that data set really quickly. Now, I recognize you guys might want me to zoom in a little more, partially because this might be a little zoomed out. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and do that. And then I'll scroll down so we can take a look at the data. So we have, this is essentially a large credit card 
uh, transaction block that came into a small bank in the U.S. over a period of uh, about 24 hours. So what we have here are all the transactions, um, basically from time equals zero to all the way uh, to time equals, and this is seconds since that first transaction. Uh, we're looking at time equals uh, 2000, or 284,000 seconds, 806 seconds after. So uh, looking at a very, very large block of uh, customer transactions. So looking at some various factors here. Now, part of the scrubbing and normalizing process that happened here is essentially taking things like what could have been latitude and longitude and instead of them being from negative 90 to positive 90, from negative 180 to positive 180, that has been scrubbed and normalized. So it goes from 0 to 100, and it goes from 0 to 1 in some cases, so 0 to 100 or 0 to 100. That way we don't really know exactly where that position actually is, uh, but it has been scrubbed. Another piece could be, for example, customer number. Another piece could be all of these other variables. But since they've been scrubbed, they still carry their... Um, they still carry their value, but ultimately uh, it doesn't really provide us with any of the knowledge unless we have the kind of the uh, back translation uh, keys. What we do also have is amount here, and ultimately the amount is the dollar amount on those credit card transactions. And then we also have a class. So somebody went out and actually investigated these. Uh, these credit card transactions and ultimately said, if it's zero, it's not fraud. If it's a one, it absolutely is fraud. So we're looking at a data set that carries a couple hundred thousand rows, um, actually close to 500,000 or so rows. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a uh, random force regressor to ultimately take a, uh, to take a look at um, how we can kind of uh, classify some fraud. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just, and I'm going to unfortunately just uh, due to the lack of time, I'm going to copy the code blocks, but I'll explain that. Uh, at the end of um, uh, the session, uh, what happens is the video will be uploaded and we'll have an email with the uh, script and the data file. So that way, you, as you watch the video, you can kind of do it yourself as well if you ultimately want to. So I'll go ahead and you copy in a code block that gives me some summary statistics on this data file. So what we're looking at is looking at, well, how many number of fraud cases do we have? So we have 492 investigated fraud transactions, uh, and then we have uh, 284,000-ish uh, normal transactions. So remember, we do have this. Uh, we do have these transactions. So we're using a supervised model uh, to essentially look back in history and say, we're going to learn from our historical transactions from what we had our investigators come out and do. But that is going to serve as a baseline for how we treat future transactions. Uh, so we're just going to kind of take a look at our correlation matrix. So we're looking at what correlates with each other really, really well. And this is some exploratory data analysis that we'll be doing here. Uh, as part of that, we're looking at which one of those variables, whether it's 1 through 28, uh, correlates with the, each other. And we see that amount really correlates heavily with V2, uh, and it really correlates heavy uh, with V5. And the same way that V3 correlates heavy with time. So maybe V3 and V11 are probably uh, minutes and hours, and then we're looking at V2 and V5 being something like uh, debit amount, and then uh, V5 being something like the tax amount on that uh, transaction. So looking at the correlation matrix, we can kind of identify what's really closely correlated with each other. We'll see that the higher the amount, uh, uh, amount and a class don't really matter. Uh, what we're really looking at is the class is really, really tied well into these V10 through V18. So when those V8, uh, V10 or V18s are really, really high, well, our chance of fraud is actually also really, really high. So we don't really need to know what they, those are. Like I said, they could be latitude, longitude, something like that. But we don't really need to understand what they are. We just need to know that those are variables that matter. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to get rid of all that uh, class data. So I'm going to tell the data set drop that last column. I don't want to know whether or not 
um, these things are uh, fraud, I want you to put them in a separate kind of category. So I want you to put them into this uh, Y uh, variable and then leave my X variable untouched without any knowledge to the computer of what um, that actually, uh, what the, uh, whether it was fraud or not actually was. So then I'm going to create new data frames to essentially just pull the values from those two. And this is where I get to do some uh, data prepping. So up until now, it was exploratory data analysis. Now we get to do some data prepping. So we're going to use sklearn, which is the standard library for um, a statistical analysis when it comes to uh, Python. And we're going to bring a train test split in to essentially tr uh, split our data between a training set and a testing set. And we usually do this just because we want to hide some data from our model so that way we can come back to it later and say, let's compare the model that I've built with the reality that's out there. And to do that, I wanna hide some of that data from the model that I'm using uh, my training set for, and then ultimately compare the two. So that way I know if my model is really good or not. And the model that we've selected today is going to be that random forest classifier. Now, random forest classifier, what it does is it takes a look at multiple different scenarios of classifying this, and it finds that decision tree, uh, which is ultimately the best at classifying the data that we have. So it's a very process intensive, um, it's a very, very process intensive algorithm. It does require a lot of compute power. It does require a lot of um, kind of storage and, and processing power. But because we're doing this on Databricks and we have a cluster um, that's got that's given me 14 gigabytes of data, that's giving me a lot of uh, processing power, I can actually run half a million records in almost seconds. And we're actually going to uh, to kind of do that here. Uh, ultimately, uh, this is going to take this is going to be the longest step. I'm running the model, I'm fitting my data against it, and then I'm using my testing data to predict some of my Y variables. And then ultimately, when I do that, this is going to take a couple seconds, but in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring in my plus here. We're going to have what looks like 99% accuracy and 97% uh, precision when it comes to the model that we've selected. So this is a really, really powerful model, but it's also a really, really good model at determining these uh, transactions. And then ultimately, when we look at well, how did it perform? When we look at our confusion matrix for that, we have our true class, which is basically what was it in reality? What did the investigators tell us it was in reality versus our predicted class? What did my model tell me this was going to be? And we see that um, the bulk of the transactions that they were normal and it was 56,862 transactions were in fact normal and our model said yeah, that's absolutely normal. Now, there were 22 transactions, a very, very small amount of those transactions that were actually fraud, but our model said uh, was normal. So those are what we call um, false uh, negatives. We also have uh, 76 transactions that our model said was fraud, and indeed they were fraud. And then we also had two transactions which our model said was fraud, and uh, they were actually normal. So those are what we call false positives. So ultimately, our model performed really, really, really well if in a case of 60,000 folks, only two get bothered uh, for being declared uh, fraud when they were actually real. And the rest, well, those are the ones that 22 are missed opportunities. So we're gonna look for ways to make our models any better. And then 76 were actually caught fraud that were indicated as fraud. So this is a model that essentially performs really, really well when it comes to outlying detection. Uh, we looked at a, a sample of credit card transactions based on a multitude over uh, 30 input variables, looking at the time, looking at the amount, and then also having that reality check to say, was it actually fraud? Was, did our investigators go out there? And, and look at fraud. Now, in this case, where our predicted class was fraud, but it was actually classed as normal, these two, in reality, what happens is these two get sent back to the investigator and said, actually, our model thinks this is fraud. Can you look into these a little deeper? And an investigator will go out and said, you know what, I might have missed something here, and then kind of continue that investigation to, to confirm whether or not uh, it was actually true.
so that essentially kind of uh, wraps everything up. I'll stop my share in my screen share here. I will go to the next slide. Uh, how, how, you know, what do we do next? How do we get started? Well, anytime you want to build an anomaly detection algorithm, uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to identify the personal or financial gain. What is the metric associated to that? Uh, take that metric and make sure that's your golden uh, kind of torch that you're looking to, to achieve. Uh, the second step that we want to do is we want to process the data co correctly, do some uh, exploratory data analysis, do some um, uh, uh, data transformation, and then ultimately uh, building that model, uh, containerizing that solution. Once we've built that model, then what we could do is we could save it and then upload it and use that for real-time transactions. So ultimately, I can pass those variables in real time. I can pass the time in real time, the amount in real time through this model, and we'll, it will predict for me whether it's fraud or normal right in that second because it saves that equation, that underlying model uh, in its history, and then ultimately is able to tell me uh, in any second. And lastly, uh, feel free to talk to us. We, we have delivered machine learning solutions in anomaly detection. Uh, they don't all work to 99% uh, uh, precision and accuracy, uh, but they do well enough that there are some cost savings and there are some revenue generated uh, when it comes to identification of fraud and then um, you know cost savings from the um, lack of claim payout and so on and so forth. So, uh, this is really a, a problem that we love uh, dealing with. This is really a problem that we enjoy uh, kind of tackling. Uh, they are complex problems, but the math is always there to kind of support, um, the, support the initiatives. So thank you again. I uh, appreciate everybody taking their time. We do have about one minute for questions. If you'd like to use the chat uh, for Q&A, uh, please go ahead and do that. Uh, I don't see any questions from the presentation, so I think that was good. Um, just as a final reminder, these will be uh, the slide, uh, the slides, the uh, script, and the data file will all be sent out to uh, to you folks later with a link to rewatch the the video at a later time. So thank you again, uh, everybody, for uh, joining, and uh, looking forward to seeing you all. Uh, in the future. All right, thank you, Piero, for that. That was great. Um, I would like to mention, if you wanted to dive deeper into Databricks or see any uh, personalized demonstrations of the platform, please feel free to reach out to us and we can walk you through that as well. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for tuning in with us this afternoon. I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Um, and thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.